Nashville, capital of the US state of Tennessee. But what is it most famous for? Music. Here, you'll see the Grand Ole Opry House, home of the famous Grand Ole Opry stage and radio show in Music Valley. You'll also see the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum, as well as the historic Ryman Auditorium downtown. And I'd like to tell you about a remarkable music story here. Naomi Streamer began as a young pop star. She had every sign of rising up to the elite in those concerts all over America. But something pushed her to a rather different career, a very special career. Yes, it's all about music, but it's also about something that can lift us all up even higher. Here we are in the music center of America, Nashville. And the most famous event and location here, the Grand Old Opry. This is actually Ryman Auditorium, the original site of the Grand Old Opry House. It was first opened way back in 1892 as the Union Gospel Tabernacle. Yes, a church. Believe it or not, it was built by a riverboat captain and Nashville businessman who owned several saloons, Thomas Ryman. There was a famous revivalist back then, Samuel Porter Jones, who really impacted people. And Thomas wanted a big tabernacle for him. Hundreds of thousands of visitors from around the world would come here to take it in. After Thomas Ryman died, the tabernacle was renamed after him, Ryman Auditorium. And then, it was used for Grand Old Opry broadcast from 1943 through to 1974. Those were weekly country music stage concerts, and it presented the biggest stars of that genre. And it went on the radio right across America. It was, in a sense, a one-hour radio barn dance and would become the longest-running radio broadcast in history. This Opry showcases a mix of legends and contemporary chart toppers. They perform country, bluegrass, folk, gospel, and even comedy skits. Today, this Ryman Auditorium is a National Historic Landmark. And because of its origin as a tabernacle, it's called the Mother Church of Country Music. It grew so much, in fact, that in 1974, the Opry had to build a larger venue here. Just outside of Nashville is the new location for the Grand Old Opry. Country fans flood here to enjoy the concerts. Well, the Grand Old Opry was just the beginning. Now there are all kinds of places in this city where music flows out. Yes, where some of the most popular songs are first performed. This is Robert's Western World, a honky-tonk in Nashville. It is hosted and continues to host many of the big-name country artists. A band named BR549 used to do a four-hour nightly gig here. They went on to play for some of the great country singers, George Strait, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw. But this place also hosted some of the huge classic rock bands like Crosby, Stills and Nash. Yes, all kinds of people come to this city. There's so much music celebrated here. Well, I've come to Dark Horse Studios to meet a talented and popular singer who does perform a lot of music, but who also has a remarkable story. Let's go and meet Naomi Streamer. I've seen a thousand roads and some of them I've taken. I've been lost so many times, forgotten or forsaken. Hi Naomi, it's good, so good to see you. I guess seeing these gold and the platinum records brings back some memories. Oh yes, it looks very familiar. <laughs> so Naomi, tell us, what have been some of the highlights of your music career? 
Well, goodness, you know, I think the big highlight was signing the multi-million dollar recording contract when I was 18. Five albums, five million dollars, that was extraordinarily huge. Um, and it was followed by number one singles and accolades and press and people saying huge statements about my career and what, what it was going to be. But, you know, there's always that point where you say, is this really what I want? Um, is this, is my dream really everything that I thought it would be? What's it like being a pop star? Well, we're in a room that pop stars spend lots of time in. Uh, for me, I remember, you know, you, you can spend 12, 14 hours a day in here for weeks. And, and that is the life of it. You know, you write the songs and you demo the songs and then you wait for the record company to choose the songs. And, you know, it's this whole process where pieces start to come together, this big puzzle. Um, and, you know, on the surface, it's very glamorous. There's a lot of work. And it's not always exactly what we imagine it will be going in. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than meets the eye. Tell us about the beginning. How and when did you get involved in singing as a life goal? Well, I grew up in a musical family, although we did not have any entertainment. So my musical entertainment was my parents writing songs. And when I was six years old, I decided I wanted to become a singer, which is interesting for someone who doesn't listen to the radio, and that was me. And I became adamant about it, and it was all I really wanted to do. So when I did discover the radio at around 10, I thought, I, I, have, to, I have to be on this thing. And so continued working hard through my teen years, and that really just led me to this career. And for me, I was so focused on the goal, I never thought of failing. I never thought there was even opportunity to fail. And so for me, it was, I'm just going to find a way to make this work. And... Um, I was a bit of an odd child. I would have rather work on my career than hang out with my peers. And that's what I did through my teens. And you began writing songs too, didn't you? Yes. And writing for me was not something I wanted to do. I wanted to be a vocalist, like my favourite singer, Celine Dion. And I thought, I can just sing. And I went into a studio when I was about uh, 14 to make a demo. And I went in and I said, this is, the, this is the song I'm going to do. And the producer looked at me and he said, well, did you write it? And I said, no. And he said, well, we're not recording it because it's not you. And I said, well, many people sing songs that aren't them. And he said, well, you're never going to go anywhere unless you start writing songs. And I was so upset with him saying that, that I wasn't good enough to do it just on my vo voice, that I went home and I said, I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to write songs, not because I have to, but because I can. And then I'm going to say I don't need to. <laughs> I was very stubborn. And so I, I, that's how I began writing songs, um, which ended up proving to be very useful to me. You were 18 years old, stepping into Sony Records for a record deal worth millions of dollars. What was that like? Well, to me, this record deal meant the world. It was all I had wanted for as long as I could remember. And I had worked toward it, sacrificing many other things. And so, and Sony in particular was the label I wanted to, to be with. I'd met with several that week and had callbacks and callbacks until I was with the president of Sony. And to put things into perspective, when I went on this trip to New York, my father had said, you know, my dad was a literature man. He sold Bible books door to door. And he said, we can't afford this. We can't afford to send you all over the world to make music. Um, so this is it. And I remember I made a promise to my dad when I got on the plane, I said, dad, I'm coming home with a record deal which was ridiculous. And if you, you know, if you're in the industry, you go, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna take months and showcases and going back and forth. And, and that was it in that moment with that president, she said, do you want to sign with our company? And I, I, I remember just being so overwhelmed. I didn't even say yes. I was just like, <gasps> and it was a Valentine's day and I, I ran out of the office. They pulled me up in a limo and there was flowers and and I called my dad and I said dad guess what I'm coming home with my record deal it's pretty phenomenal Naomi you've performed with some of the biggest names in pop music like Carlos Santana what was that like well you know working with Carlos Santana he's one of the quietest calmest most humble people you'll ever meet so getting together in the studio was a rather extraordinary situation and when he first hit the guitar I remember immediately recognizing that 
just so distinctive sound. And I remember that moment in particular, just being a couple feet away from him and hearing that on something I'd written. And I remember that moment going, this is, this is the moment that I'm going to remember forever. And, um, it was really wonderful. You know, he's a really good guy. And we went on after that to shoot a music video together. And, and you know, it was, it, was, it was just extraordinary. It was a wonderful situation. Naomi, you actually had a number one album. And yet... Well, you know, the number one hit, it's, it's funny because you go into the industry and you think it's going to be perfect and it's going to be just like what I see on TV and just like I imagine. Um, but it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. And... You know, it's a, it's a lot of running through back doors and through kitchens to get to the stage. And I mean that metaphorically and physically, where, um, you know, you, it starts to unravel uh, the truth behind the industry. And it's a lot of hard work and, and there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And even though we had, we reached this number one status with the Carlos Santana song, um, it, it just it just never really fulfilled in the way that I thought it would. And it never came to this moment where I thought, oh, you know, this is it. Um, for me, it was always just lacking. And the stuff was always going on behind the scenes that just didn't quite feel right. Um, and like as though things were on the verge of falling apart. And many times there had been ups and downs and ups and downs. And, and you know, I was a great rebounder um, in the industry. But... It just never felt fully satisfying. It wasn't a feeling that you could relax in and go, ah, oh, you know, I got to where I was working hard to get for all these years. Um, that wasn't that wasn't it. It was it was something is uneasy about this for me. Your career has taken many twists and turns. In your book Backstage, you found yourself in hip hop stars Puff Daddy Studio. What happened there? Yeah, I, I had never thought that I would end up in Sean Puff Daddy Combs' hip-hop studio in New York City um, because I wasn't a hip-hop artist. I was a pop artist. Um, but in this journey that I was on, you get this kind of pressure that you don't want to miss your opportunity or you don't want to get out of the game for even a moment because then someone else will come in and take your place. And I knew it wasn't for me. I knew it wasn't right. And I felt as though I was starting to compromise even my own dream. And I found myself in this hallway and knowing I didn't want to be there that evening, knowing that I, I somehow was not feeling good about the situation. And I had been picked up the night before by a chauffeur at the airport, you know, um, to take me to my hotel and to the studio and very lovely guy. And he started to come down the hallway and, um, you know, it was just this very unusual situation that took place where he stopped, I stopped, we stared at each other. He made this odd comment of having a dream about me the night before. Um, and something popped in my head because most people would have been like I'm out of here that was my cue to go and for me I had heard the night before that this man was a Christian and so for me I was a Christian and I thought there's a connection and I'm just going to see what this guy is trying to say and what he was trying to say was that you know, the Holy Spirit had given him a message in this dream he'd had the night before with an angel uh, just you know this supernatural situation and at the beginning I really thought he was pulling my leg I thought he was just taking me for a road to be like funny funny joke at the end um, but it wasn't it was very serious and it was very real and he began to tell me the story of my life and at the end of that story of my life as I was listening to it he began to tell me my prayers that I'd, I'd had only with the Lord you know these were not the prayers I shared with other people. And when it got to that point, I knew this was something much bigger than the two of us. This was God intervening in my life in a, in a hip hop studio. You know, he had really was making a huge effort to shake me and say, you know, I'm on the verge of losing you, but I want to send you this message to see if you're going to listen. And the message was, you can continue to chase after your dreams. And you can continue ending up at this road asking yourself, what am I doing here? Why isn't this working out the way I want it to? Or you can, at this moment in your life, turn away from the dreams you've been chasing and pursuing and being so adamant about, and you can pursue me. And that message was you can pursue God, giving up everything else. And if you just pursue him, Jesus, 
then at the end of that road, all your dreams will come true. And, you know, I think it's the message that comes to all of us at some point or maybe multiple points in our life. And there it was for me being given to me in a hallway in a hip hop studio in the heart of New York City. And I remember I ran out of there shaking, you know, with the tail spine tingling. And and I remember thinking to myself, no one's ever going to believe this happened. And they're going to say I'm crazy. And and I, I didn't know who to tell or what to do, but I knew God had just made a huge effort to get my attention. And he, he had gotten my attention. And then you meet Randy Jackson, American Idol. That must have seemed like a big move forward. Randy Jackson, I mean, he is a household name icon for from the American Idol franchise and there I, I ran into him on an airplane and the the whole situation was so unusual and when he sat down next to me and said you know I've been thinking about you and there's a project I want to work with you on you think you you t- take that and you go there has to be something behind me like this is this is not real and and so even though I had gotten that message in the studio from God you start to question, you go, well, maybe this is from God. Is this maybe God's uh, idea of my future and not my idea? And I did go down the road with Randy and, you know, we started working together on this project. Songs began getting written, produced, and I was getting the glimpse of that world again where every every day I would drive into the studio and I'd park my little car between the Bentleys and, and you know, the Rolls Royces. And, and it's, just, it's just like this is a little taste of what your fu- future could be. Um, but as this was happening and as I was going deeper into the project and was starting to feel the people that I was working with were pulling away saying, what are your priorities? And it became such a head point where it was, you know, we know God is a thing in your life. And is he the thing or is he just kind of a side thing? Because if you're going to do this, you have to be 100% in with no distractions. This has to be your God. And God, your God will understand. I remember that was a conversation, not with Randy, but with the people who uh, were involved. And at the same time, I had found myself at, it is written, uh, meetings that were happening every night. There was a there was an evangelistic series going on. And for me, I was hearing, uh, you know, one side of the story of history and the future and what God is calling each of us to do and our role to play um, in what is taking place on earth. And then I was getting told during the day that, you know, God will understand if you put him on the back burner. And it just got to a point where I knew I absolutely knew, I don't want this anymore. You know, I don't want what the world can offer me. I don't want all the shine and the glamour, which really is just smoke and mirrors in the end. I want what God is calling me to because the world just cannot compare and the world can't fulfill what God can in your life and and cannot give you that peace and cannot take you to places that, that no one else can take you. And finally, I got to the point where I said, you know, God is the dream I'm chasing um, because I know how that dream ends and that dream ends with eternity and that's the one that I want to I want to hook my cart to. Yeah. And now you've committed your life to God and you believe that he's leading you. He had some big surprises in store for you, didn't he? Well, God kind of took over my career because there was a point where I thought, I'm out. I'm just going to live a nice little quiet life. And God started to open doors and close doors. Um, And he was calling me to this music ministry. And that's now what I do full time. And it has taken me around the world singing and proclaiming God's love, not just for me, but for everyone, because I'm not the only one who has this story of God calling to each of us saying, I have a dream for you. I have a plan for you. And and I feel like I, you know, my purpose now is to share what God has done in my life to hopefully inspire others. They can do it too, because I'm not the only one. And and God has just been blessing. And I I look at things that I used to think were significant in my career, and those things I couldn't care less about now. And for me, it's watching lives transform. And I get to see that now when I when I have concerts and when I go places to sing for the Lord, I see lives changing. You know, I see people transformed forever. And what really is happening is I'm meeting people that I'm going to see again one day, you know, and it's just, it's so wonderful because you're really just meeting family around the world and um, encouraging each other in strength that yes, God is a great planner. Naomi, what role does God play in your life today? 
the role that God took over is really the role of everything. Uh, and I know that sounds really broad, but that is how I wake up. That is how I go to sleep. And it is simply, Lord, take me where I am to go next um, and take me as far as I can go. And then when a door closes, I know you're going to open one. They always say, you know, he might close the door and open a window and it might be a couple minutes in between and you just have to trust the windows coming. But you know that God has something always. And that is kind of where I'm at, where I say, this is exciting and this is fun and I'm going to enjoy this moment that you have given me because I have no idea where it's going next. And I'm an adventurous spirit, so I love that. And that's kind of the role my husband and I have taken with this entire thing. You know, I remember we were making a move and we thought, our move would be, okay, we're going to pack up this house two months. We're going to do a couple shows and then go get another house and unpack. And we had no idea that God's plan was you're going to be on the road touring, uh, going from church to church and, and having concerts for a year. And at the end of that, we look back and we say, you know, God's plan's always way more fun. And so he really is the, you know, the creator and the planner of my, my dreams. That's it. But you knew that everything that I know now. Oh, you knew. What a great story Naomi has to share. What a great story about finding your purpose in life. Do you ever wonder about that? Do you ever question if you really have a purpose and if there's a guide who can really guide you that well? That question is reflected on this Shelby Street pedestrian bridge in Nashville. It goes over the Cumberland River. A lot of people walk here from one big event to another. Why? because on one side is Nashville downtown. A lot of things happening there, of course. And on the other side is a huge football stadium. This is where the Tennessee Titans play. Yes, quite the scene here that pictures which way to go, which direction, which event, which place do I really belong in? I'd like to show you something important about getting a good kind of guidance in your life. There are two basic mistakes that cause most of our problems when we seek guidance. Some people tend to base major life decisions just on impulses, on urges. Others are very cautious, always waiting for guidance, seeking it, but never quite getting a clear word. So here's what we need to do when seeking guidance, when trying to get across the bridge to the right side. Take a good look at your personal style. Do you run ahead of divine guidance or lag behind? Impulsive people can take a lesson from the life of Jesus. He once spent a whole night in prayer before making an important decision. Yes, we need to wait on the Lord, developing an ear for His voice. Cautious people can take a lesson from Jesus too. His basic command was, follow me. Jesus was always on the move, and his disciples learned to find God's plan for their lives while following him, while accepting new challenges. Wait on the Lord and follow me. 
We need both of these things in our lives, reflection and action, listening and following. It's only in that process, in that trial and error, that we can get real guidance, find our real purpose. Naomi did. Yes, after all her challenges, troubles, she feels she's been led to such a wonderful, fulfilling purpose in life. I believe you can too. I believe there's a divine guidance out there that you can take in. Why not ask for it right now as we pray? Dear Father, thank you for caring about our direction, our lives. Thank you for having such good plans for us. We pray that we will become better in seeking guidance. Help us to see our tendencies. Help us to both wait and follow. Thank you for what you can lay out. Thank you for taking us across the bridge. In Jesus' name, Amen. What a great story Naomi has to share. What a great story about finding your best purpose in life. If you've enjoyed our program, Pop Star with a Purpose, and would like to find the happiness and fulfillment that Naomi Streamer discovered, be sure to order the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's a booklet entitled, Heaven, Is It For Real? This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. There are many lessons that can be learned from Naomi Streamer's story, lessons that can make a difference to our lives today. So don't miss this opportunity to obtain your free booklet. Here's the information you need. Phone us now on 048 101 or text us on 0491 999 or visit our website theincrediblejourney.tv to request today's free offer. So don't delay. Contact us right now. If you've enjoyed today's journey, be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together and experience another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. The incredible journey truly is television that changes lives. Until next week, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.